I think they got it. You got it? Okay. All right. So this talk is uh, DevOps Redux. Um, I am not Kevin Johnson. I apologize for you that are disappointed. You've it got said a, handsome man in the back. <laughs> in the back there. Um, I'm not Kenneth Bone. Sad, I wish I was. He's sadly. got a cool sweater game. I am Ken Johnson. I'm the Chief, ne Chief Technology Officer at Invisium. Uh, I was, I'm former Navy, US Navy. I've talked about uh, DevOps security before with Chris, uh, advanced web hacking, and uh, some of you might know me from RailsGoat, uh, co-project owner with uh, Mike McCabe. Uh, I run engineering uh, product focused at Invisium. So you can imagine when I do that for a security company, I have a lot of concerns. And that's sort of a, a part of which we'll get to what this talk or how this talk originated, or at least how some of the pieces fit. So, so that's me. Uh, I'm currently on the blue team over at Uber doing incident response stuff mostly. Uh, spent a bunch of years in the army. That was awesome. That's why my knees hurt. Uh, and those are kind of the topics I've talked about. Primarily, most of my career, I've been a breaker. Uh, so breaking things, breaking into Oracle, Windows, phishing, uh, purple teaming, doing a lot of purple teaming now. Uh, and then did the DevOps talk with Ken. So as I've moved to these California companies uh, where they're actually using DevOps, uh, it's obviously a natural slide and a natural fit to try to break that stuff. So that, that's what brought the other talk. Uh, and then we'll talk about the background for this talk as well. And so, yeah. Now foolish time fixer, and I think if anybody saw Dave Lewis's talk yesterday and I've talked to Josh Corman, uh, there's a lot of people that are saying, hey, you should actually, if you're a red team guy, you should actually start doing blue team stuff. And since I've done that, I've learned a lot of things and empathy has really come about. I've learned to love Python and the REST APIs because that's not so bad. But I'm also like super astonished at the number of people that literally cannot internet. Um, it's pretty bad, so it's been eye-opening. So our original DevOps talk, um, which I believe was first, firstly, first done at LastCon, something like that? Yeah, it was at LastCon. Yeah, so uh, essentially we just picked apart all of the tools that DevOps shops use and you know, figured out how to break, what was easiest to break into, what gave us the most impact, and then shared it with everybody. After that, though, folks asked us, okay, well, how do you fix, right? How do you fix these things? In tandem with that, when folks asked, you know, how do we go about like securing our DevOps type shops, continuous development or continuous deployment rather. Um, so our company actually had no legitimate attack, but we had the threat of an attack. And so while thinking about how to do this right, I also thought, okay, what is, you know, both Chris and I have gone through this. What's practical? What do we actually need to secure? And I think what you find, what I find interesting anyway is about my own talk, it's weird to say, right? But uh, is that, so this isn't necessarily super AppSec focused, it's more of a meld of our two uh, lines of work, right? Application security and network security. So. Yeah, and I'll add that um, this has kind of been my life the last three years of how do you secure these developer environments where these guys and girls have to have basically do whatever they want on their workstations, uh, has to be very much allowed. And then uh, in my case, both at uh, Facebook and now current and at Uber, fairly open from an egress point of view. So how do you defend a network when a lot of things can, can just go outbound? And that actually forces you to look at things at the host level uh, rather than the network level, which is a, a unique challenge. So we're gonna talk about a bit of, bit of that. Yeah, and actually in the Netflix, Netflix talk yesterday, they were saying that you know, engineers that come on board are pretty quickly given prod access, and that's pretty indicative of the environments that we're talking about. So I'm going to hand this over to you. Oh, thanks. Oh, so uh, there's a lot of slides. We'll be around after, but we did hear we have the whole hour, so we'll pace ourselves. Uh, you have the links to the slides, and then we're going to break this up into human stuff, uh, host-based stuff like I was talking about, and then infrastructure, which is going to primarily be uh, AWS infrastructure. So starting with the employee intelligence and like basically the human thing, so we're gonna make it difficult for our employees to get us hacked. Uh, so examples of things that we need to do, we need to monitor uh, paste bin like services for data about our network or uh, and hashes or anything. Uh, GitHub, like the Netflix guys talked about yesterday, pretty common uh, for people that are using GitHub to have organizations and people accidentally check in what should be private, make it in their public repos. 
So examples of things that we talked about the last talk are the things that Ken and I see all the time. Slack tokens in GitHubs, uh, lots of interesting configs in like the dot files or their dot zsh files for, uh, you know, they, everybody wants to upload their dot files to GitHub so they can put them on any dev server they got to jump on. And then lots of tokens and logs and snippets and error, error messages. You want, you want to find those things because they can be used. And uh, I'm sure everybody can think of many cases where people have found those and have used them. Like code search should be code search. Yeah, right? code search is Code search is example. probably the big example that everybody uses where lost AWS key, someone logged in and deleted. Code spaces. Code spaces. Yeah, yeah. Lost those configs and then everyone log logged in and deleted all their stuff and that company is out of business. Has anyone heard of code spaces? Yeah, exactly. Cool. All right, two. Awesome. Look it up. It's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So monitoring GitHub, you can use uh, Scrumbler. Mm -hmm. Saw that yesterday. Uh, we're going to be trying that out. Shout um, out. Can totally use that. Um, you can also use internal tools, but they're kind of hard to use sometimes. So GitLab, Gitalite. Uh, you can pay for GitHub Enterprise. A lot of people use Fabricator. Oh, see, there's the guy leaving one minute into it. <laughs> uh, but most people don't. Uh, you use GitHub because GitHub's super convenient. But then you have the problem that you need to monitor uh, what people are doing because people make mistakes and they will post internal repos to their public repo. It happens a lot. I've, I've talked to many people. It happens all the time. The Netflix guys mentioned it yesterday that it happens there too. So uh, it's something you want to be aware of and something, something that you want to fix as soon as possible. So how you can tackle that? Um, you can have your, most places have the employees join their org so you can kind of know who's, who's who. You can regularly crawl those list of members, check out the repos, and then do regexes, which is exactly what Scrum Alerts can do. But uh, a tool called GitRob also does that. Has anybody heard of this? So yeah, so it's pretty nice. Uh, you probably need to add a few regexes on your own uh, to do some more things, but it's a good starting point uh, if you don't want to build your own uh, system to do that. It kind of looks like that when you run it. Um, you know, I've been doing bug bounty stuff, so I like to start with seeing has anybody checked in anything awesome into the company's repos. So in this case, I think this was Magneto. Um, then it found, hey, someone had checked in a git config, and inside that git config was their GitHub tokens. Right, so that's not good. I've also found plenty of AWS keys. Um, those are the favorite. I think everybody loves those. Um, so those are things that we want to identify and wor uh, get rid of as quickly as possible. So going with that, um, I like to troll GitHub and look for AWS keys. And I got bored one weekend and wrote some code that basically takes an AWS secret key, an access key, and then tries it against every Bodo function that you can do to see what you have access to. So uh, Nimbostratus does this for like five to six hosts. And then I went and found out there's like probably closer to 50 in AWS land. Um, and so what we did is so on the top there it shows, hey, that's an invalid key. Um, at the bottom shows, hey, that's a root account. You really don't need to do anything else because you have root for everything. Um, then it keeps going. It starts once uh, that it starts brute forcing to see, okay, well, do I have access to EC2? Do I have access to SQS? What do I have access to? Right. Um, By the way, these aren't example access keys that he like put together himself. These are ones he pulled off the internet that were disclosed. So yeah, and then I let them know. But uh, yeah. it's always fun to like see if they work. To reiterate. <laughs> yeah, and the same thing, like S, uh, try to list S3 buckets. So very quickly identify what you have access to, because a lot of times from a, from a blue team perspective, you can usually just log into IAM and actually look. Uh, you know, if you're pen testing or if you're a bad guy, I don't have that luxury. I need to figure out what I have access to, and there's more to AWS than EC2. So here's some example tools that you can use if you've got to monitor pace bin. Uh, Dumpmon is one. Has anybody used that or seen this? Cool. It's worth checking out. Um, you can basically configure it to look for whatever you want and then uh, tweet it to the world or just send it to yourself. Um, there's four pay services. Anybody heard of Recorded Future? So if you don't want to roll your own, you could pay people like Recorded Future to do that for you and they'll monitor keywords that you look for, things for your company, across all that um, if you have money to do that. Um, if you're looking for creds, uh, places like Hold Security will... Um, look on the dark web and in the internet for you for your, comp your company's creds or anything useful to you. Um, also useful if you don't want to do that or you don't speak Russian. Um, that's for you. That's yours. All right. So that was mostly about, um, you know, catching stuff that's accidentally exposed uh, from an application security side of the house, from a just, you know, keeping, making sure code is pristine 
Um, one tool I started using and uh, did a trial with was Git Monitor. I, I really liked it. Um, there are a few things that are pretty nice here. For one, if somebody force pushes to uh, like the master branch, you can get a notification on it. Uh, one of the things I thought was really nice with it was that uh, you can have a sp specific sort of unique keyword in the comments for when a pull request is merged. And if that specific keyword is not in that uh, uh, merge, then you get, you, know, you get a notification. Uh, really useful if you want security to you know, undergo a review for a specific application every time there's a merge or something along those lines. Um, so there's a few things you can, uh, you can monitor in, in terms of merging uh, and, and pushing code. So really useful tool. All right, let's transition to some of the things you want to do if you've got to worry about people that are uh, their, their hosts, so Windows hosts or Linux hosts or OS X hosts. So kind of the outline for that. Um, OS Query, anybody heard of OS Query? A couple. Um, it's pretty awesome. It allows you to basically instrument uh, Linux and Mac, and now there is a Windows thing for, I think, Windows 10 and above. Um, but it's super useful. I won't read all that to you, but basically you can enumerate all this data about a system and then use a SQL, basically SQL, to query that. And it also has built in the ability to forward all those logs to a central place so you could actually alert on them and do something with those. So um, if you're managing like a Mac fleet or uh, any kind of like Ubuntu fleets or whatever, you should check that out as a way to get data off of a host. Comes with, uh, so here's all the different queries you can do ad hoc, so like on the fly, I want to know something. Scheduled, uh, collect different logs, it has tripwire functionality. Uh, you can use Yara rules to look for known bad binaries, and it sh actually ships with a ton of query packs. Uh, and that's probably completely illegible, but um, basically, Facebook, it's a Facebook uh, open source product, uh, gives you tons and tons of query packs so you can look for known badness uh, out of the box. And then it's pretty easy to write your own if you're looking for something specific or you're worried about a specific config in your organization, like you want to make sure everyone has uh, disk encryption enabled. Uh, there's query packs for that, or you can roll your own to make sure the chef is, chef is working or, or whatever you want to do. So that's kind of what it looks like. Uh, like we, we feed ours into Splunk and then allows you to, hey, for all that, uh, for any query pack, show me all the hits for that query pack. So it just allows you to uh, find things quickly. Doorman, anybody heard of Doorman? Nobody. Awesome. All <laughs> well, right, so useful, uh, then, I guess. if you, what's that? It's, it's useful then, useful information. Glad I'm here. Yeah. Now you've heard of it. Um, it allows you to actually manage that fleet. So if you want to push a change, uh, most of the time you'd have to push a change via chef or, or puppet. Um, doorman would allow you to, uh, if you have, you want to search the fleet for something, if you're using Doorman, you could actually uh, run that query and do that. Uh, based on the node. So it kind of looks like that. You have a fancy web interface, <coughs> super blurry. Uh, fancy web interface that shows all your nodes and then will allow you to do actions on all the nodes in the enterprise. So uh, if you're using OS Query and then you want to actually do things on those hosts in a uh, ad hoc kind of way, this is a great tool to do that. Anybody heard of Block Block? Sweet, man. Everybody's getting the education there. <laughs> I guess. Sweet. Yeah. All right, so basically it's a kernel extension that looks to see uh, whenever you've got any software that's trying to persist, it will like let you know. I'm like, hey, uh, I'm bad. I'm trying to add this to the launch statement, so I come, I started everything at startup, and do you want to allow that or not? So uh, enable your people locally to make some safe and smart decisions. You can use a tool like that. How about little snitch? All right, cool. Yes. Yeah, 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 finally, um, Postbase Firewall. Um, you should probably, you should definitely use it. Uh, help people out. It also, uh, as long as they don't click allow all, which is pretty annoying. It can do if you don't tune it. Um, kind of looks like that. How about Carbon Black? Sweet. I love Carbon Black. Carbon Black's awesome if you can afford it. A host-based agent basically allows you to do file writes, file read, network connections, outbound, registry writes, uh, you name it, you can write rules for it. Uh, some examples of things I've seen or that we use, so uh, looking for Mimikatz, everybody know what Mimikatz is? Kind of? All right. Um, app site concert. Yeah. Okay. okay. No. So, you know, for example, he signs that all those binaries with his own code signing cert that says gentle Kiwi in there. So if someone drops one of those and runs it, 
uh, Carbon Black is going to uh, log that activity, and then you can search for it and see, hey, where in the fleet is someone use this? Uh, file, uh, file Vault encryption disabled or not? Like, is someone turning that off? Is someone turning it on? Um, if someone's uninstalling Carbon Black, that's good to know. Uh, everybody, less of a problem now, but it used to be unsigned jars uh, doing bad stuff and connecting to the internet. You can look for things like that. Unsigned binaries and temp uh, doing net connections because that may be indicative of something bad happening. Yeah, I think most people in this room definitely have see, had experience with that at least. Right. Should. Same thing. And then it also works for Mac, so you can do... You know, if anyone's using the stroke stroke network utility to port scan or uh, try to find um, hashes off of those boxes, you can do that too. So it kind of looks like that. This is one for doing PowerShell. Uh, so you have cmd cmd.exe was the parent process. It kicked off PowerShell, and then PowerShell started doing those follow-on activities. So it can help you identify badness. You can write rules to look for things like PowerShell with a command line of uh, dash encoded or uh, no profile, or whatever you want to search for. Same thing for Mac. You can do, look for known badness or abnormal behavior. And Sysmon, I won't go into it, but it's poor man's carbon black. It works on Windows. Uh, has much of the same carbon black functionality, uh, less so of like how to get that data somewhere. Um, but uh, Carlos Perez and Jason Craig have given some talks about how to do that. You can use, you can forward the logs off with uh, Windows Syslog and get equivalent data as Carbon Black out of there. It's just a little bit more painful. Is this one still me? Yes. And Splunk. So, oh, once you're heavy, you have all these logs, you have to put them somewhere so that you can actually generate alerts. So you have instrumentation. Now you want to get it into a place where uh, if you're Ken, who does everything, has, where Ken has to look at it, but ideally, you have some sort of SOC or blue team or some sort of team that needs to look at that data and do some analysis and look for bad stuff. So Splunk is an option. Uh, it is free for a bit, but to get the most of the best functionality, you're going to have to buy something. Uh, they have a lot of good apps that actually help you out and can do a lot of things you would normally search for queries. So this just shows uh, uh, endpoints that are checking in and then some other things about it. Um, everyone's probably heard of Splunk. So. Uh, Aside from Splunk, if you want to go a less expensive model, you can certainly use an Elk stack, so Elasticsearch, Kibana, and uh, Logstash to actually take all those logs from somewhere, shove them into, uh, have Logstash uh, aggregate them and normalize them, shove them into Elasticsearch, and then use Kibana in the same way that you would use Splunk to look for those things. So it kind of looks like that. Is anybody using any of that? How are, yep, cool. Awesome. Uh, Okay, so this is me. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, when you do it all, and uh, maybe you don't, you know, you don't have an enterprise budget, we'll say, but you, you know, need an enterprise patching management type solution. Uh, Google created Simeon, which is a really nice package deployment option for OS X. The uh, packages are in monkey format. That's like XML, right? Uh, it's as I said, free. I think one thing to note though uh, is um, that you will have some storage costs, right? There are going to be some storage costs associated with this after a certain amount of machines are running using Simeon. So um, here's where you can uh, download Simeon. I think there's two important pieces to Simeon. There's the client and then there's the, uh, the server, right? The uh, web application runs up in uh, Google Cloud, obviously. Um, and that's where you manage you know, your clients, that's where you push out patches from, that's where you can see if like disk space is low or whatever the case is. And in terms of the client, that's a DMG that you package up. Uh, one thing that's really nice about it is that you know, you're gonna have your private and public key plus a config that you need to uh, have on a per user basis. So you can put that all into the DMG. I highly recommend you know, GPG encrypting or whatever you need to do to make sure it's secure when you transfer it or install it on a computer. Uh, but once you've done that, it's connected to the, the you know, mothership and you can push out patches all day long. It's sort of what it looks like. I can tell you all the versions of the OS that folks are running. Again, really centralized. Uh, this is OS X related, uh, if I didn't mention that. Um, and beyond that, I think that uh, you should know that it's gonna be a little bit difficult to get set up with in the beginning. It does take about a week. It's a, like moderately difficult to 
read through and figure it out. But once you do, it's free, it's worth it, it works really well, easy to maintain. Okay, so now this is the AWS part of the talk. So before we get started, who's using AWS? Sweet. Fantastic. Yay, relevancy. Awesome. Well, now we know the talk's relevant. So, cool. As a CTO, as somebody responsible, responsible for securing AWS, I needed to make sure a few things happened, right? I needed to harden, monitor, and be able to recover. Extremely important. And the monitoring piece is really important, right? If you suspect that attack is uh, ongoing or if you don't and you don't know that it's happening, uh, you could really pay for that. And I mean that literally, and we'll talk about that later. But uh, when you follow AWS's guidelines, if you've ever taken like their, their security CBT, you'll find that a lot of what I you know, kind of, well, Chris and I crafted is, is really does follow along with uh, their guidelines. So it's kind of nice. Um, that Probably the two lined up. What's relevant there on the, if you want to go back one, was the financially responsible piece of that, right? Yeah, we're going to get to that in the, the QR oh. thread. But yeah, okay. yeah. You're, Never you, mind. If you don't follow this, I can, I'll show you, you know, I'll show you an example of this. But uh, if you don't follow this, you could very well pay for it. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get a little, uh, we'll get into that. No. So hardening basics. Uh, don't use the root account. That's a super obvious one. And when we talk about monitoring, that'll become even more relevant. Uh, disable access keys to the root account. Again, there will be a theme here and that'll follow with it. We're gonna talk about multi-factor authentication along with multi-factor authentication on the API, which is something that I don't think a lot of people have. I've talked to a couple people here, one specifically, and some people are trying to do it, but it's not the easiest thing in the world to do if you've never <coughs> enabled it. So we'll go through that. Um, <clears throat> with the root account, every AWS environment needs a root account. It is God of that environment. Um, you should not be using this operationally. And again, when we get into the monitoring with CloudWatch section, we're gonna cover that. <clears throat> when it comes to these access keys that are associated with the root account, we talked about that, just go ahead and delete them. But one thing we didn't mention was to have a verbal as well as written policy that this account doesn't get used, unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, when it comes to multi-factor authentication, you have two routes that you can go inside of AWS. You can do this virtually with Google Authenticator or something along those lines, or you can use the hardware that AWS allows you to use, which is Jamalto. Uh, the full list is are on these slides. So, and if you came late, you missed the link that we put out there, but we'll probably show it at the end again uh, for these slides. Um, all right. So, what I should mention is, with multi-factor authentication. Um, you as an administrator have to allow users to be able to manage their own multi-factor authentication. Otherwise, and I know Chris, you can point to some examples of this, people might, uh, I don't know, email QR codes around. Not such a great thing to do, right? The QR code is obviously how you activate that MFA device. So uh, you wanna give them the ability to do that. Well, you just have to use this. You guys got that, right? No, all right. So this link is actually uh, where you can find the policy that you attach to each user. Once you attach that policy, they'll be able to, uh, you'll have to tweak it a little bit, but they'll be able to uh, manage their own MFA device and they'll be able to keep that uh, managed um, and organized. So, all right, root. You should need a multi-factor authentication code for root. Whether or not it needs to be shared, I'd advocate it should. Um, if you need to do that, you can use the, well, AWS offers TOTP, so you can leverage the TOTP protocol. Things like 1Password, they allow you to, you know, take a screenshot of that QR code and share the MFA for root with others. And I really do, uh, obviously restrict to who's got access, but I really recommend doing that. Uh, if the root account gets owned by somebody like this who found it on the internet, you're gonna have a bad day. You may not wanna share it with the whole engineering team, right? Unless it's a two-person right. engineering team, yeah. right? Probably for the best. If you got a thousand people in your engineering team, best not to put that in that shared one. Now everybody talks about multi-factor authentication, but what I didn't hear a lot of people talk about was uh, enabling multi-factor authentication on the AWS API. So to do this is actually really simple. You choose a policy that you want to have multi-factor authentication required on, and you add this one line to it. Um, so to enable it, it's really easy. To actually get people to use it and not scream at you is not so easy, right? So we're gonna cover that. Um, 
that friction, you know? Yeah, so things aren't gonna work when you do this on the API. And we're gonna, when we talk about the, the, the frequency of these, this exploit, you know, or of AWS being exploited, we're, we're, gonna dis, we're gonna pinpoint the fact that the API is where this is happening. So this is incredibly important. So I just bring that up because when you get a little bit of friction or this becomes a little bit difficult, know that it's worth it because it's where you're most likely, if you're running AWS to get exploited, is through the API. So uh, we're gonna talk about STS now. The security token service is essentially how you get a temporary set of credentials. So what happens is, is and I've got this, uh, this link with some code on it that I wrote, um, you give your access key ID, your secret, the duration that you want these temporary credentials to be okay for along with the you know, virtual device or whatever, the MFA code that you've got. And if you've set that, those temporary credentials for the day, then for just the day, you can use those pretty freely. And if they were exposed, then, you know, oh well, because tomorrow they're, well, relevance-wise and risk-wise, tomorrow they'll, they'll be renewed, so. Yeah, there are some hacks around uh, renewing those. If you have enough of a privilege level to do that, you can set it up so that they get renewed. But uh, more or less, the idea is they get checked into GitHub tomorrow, they're not useful. All right, all right. And this is an example of running the code. Um, that the gist was linked to. Um, and these are the three pieces that you're gonna get back. Like I said, ID, secret, and temporary token. And you can use those. You can see this is just an example of using EC EC a EC2 API tools, passing in, you know, dash O, dash W, dash T options. Um, and those are, like I said, the ID, secret, and session token. You can see that it still worked. Everything's still fine. It's just one extra step that people have to jump through. And uh, really, oh well, you know, honestly, it's worth it. Um, and in case you don't like Ruby, because I know a lot of people hate on me for liking Ruby, uh, there's Python and Bash if you're interested in that. And then in terms of overcoming challenges, things that won't work right off the bat, Elastic Beanstalk. Elastic Beanstalk doesn't support S uh, STS. So you need to use either GitHub or Code Commit or uh, an S3 bucket, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that, but it's an option um, where you can pull in code from those repositories using the uh, code pipeline, and you can overcome the issues that you would have with uh, STS to deploy code. So, uh, password policy, not gonna go over this in a huge, you know, in a huge way, but uh, you should enable passwords, or ha enable a password policy, you should have one. And I say that because I've reviewed enough AWS environments to see that they don't have one, and uh, so that's yeah, a little strange. Have one. Um, so recap: make make this and make AWS harder to get to in a very practical, sensible way. All right, it's not magic. Um, things we didn't talk about in this talk: S3 bucket policies, encrypting EC2 volumes, SSH or sorry, security groups, uh, locking those down. Those are things we really don't need to talk about because if you Google. AWS security, there's about 100,000 checklists out there that cover all of this, as well as AWS's operational uh, and auditing and security checklists. But I would say use Trusted Advisor. It's very low cost, and uh, it'll give you like the low-hanging fruit that those checklists uh, you know, tell you to, to cover. Okay, here's an example of some of those checklists. Again, you can download these power, this PowerPoint later and get them. Uh, all right, so monitoring. We want to detect, let me get some water actually real quick, sorry. So we want to detect malicious activity, right? Um, and we want that in real time. So there's a few services that actually help us with doing that that are built in AWS. You don't have to buy anything, there's no widgets, you're just gonna configure some stuff, so. I will say that when you turn these services on, you're gonna get a lot of noise, so be prepared to figure out how to filter. CloudTrail, SNS, CloudWatch, and Config. Uh, CloudTrail is essentially where all logs for AWS get stored, and I'll show you a diagram in a second. SNS is how you receive notifications when things have triggered an alert. When some change or some activity has triggered an alert, it's gonna get pushed to SNS, and SSS, SNS is gonna notify you and your team. And then there's uh, CloudWatch, right? And Config, which are going to detect whatever activity you configure them to detect. Um, here is a diagram of all of the services that are sort of filtering uh, directly into um, our, our logging and will get pulled out later to, to trigger some, some notifications to you. So this is essentially what it looks like. 
You can see in the middle config and CloudWatch pull from CloudTrail and they push to SNS. SNS. All right, in terms of CloudTrail, uh, it's very easy to use. You simply turn it on. That's it. Turn it on. And immediately it starts logging everything that's going on in your AWS environment. Um, there are some configurable options. We walk through those in the slides. Um, give them, you know, give your, your CloudTrail bucket a name. Um, allow the authorization of an IAM roll through. And uh, it's enabled. That's it. That's all you got to do. The first step is just turn it on. Now, for SNS, uh, to get this going, well, first of all, let me say that I love it. Uh, it allows you to get instant notifications via SMS. It works very well. You don't have to build any extra queuing yourself. Um, emails, whatever, post an API that you've built. That might be how you decide to filter out all of the alert alerts you get. Um, so you can receive notifications for very important things. We're going to talk a little bit about that when we go through some of the alerts that we're going to set up. Um, to set it up, you just create a topic. Create a topic that's important. Like this one says root account usage. Right? We're circling back to the whole root account being used piece. So you create a topic, and then you subscribe to it in some form or fashion. This is SMS. Uh, this is email. You, just, you can have multiple subscribers that subscribe to a single topic. I uh, do want to mention, set these up first if you know what alarms you're going to be setting up. Because when we go into CloudWatch and Config, if you don't have those set up already, you're going to have to exit out of what you're doing, what you're doing to go into SNS, set it up, and then go back into the services and complete configuration. So con <laughs> Config, Ken gets to drink water now. So basically, it allows you to do resource inventory, configuration history, uh, and then pick what you want to monitor for change notifications. Uh, you can define your own things. It comes prepackaged with a whole bunch of options, which I'll show in a second. The idea is you can do discovery, compliance, change management, and then it can assist with all your incident response activities as well, because it should have a log of what changed when someone changed it, and that may be the key piece of information you need to figure out how something got owned. So uh, here's some examples of the ones that come prepackaged. You know, is CloudTrail enabled? You know, is incoming SSH disabled? All the other ones. Uh, big list down at the bottom. Yeah, these are like basic compliance rules, essentially. So they try to help you out with a bunch of other stuff to start with. So things you can have alerts set up for, uh, a change in the firewall or the security groups, uh, changes in your VPC, so someone has broken in, they're able to make VPC changes to allow ports in or allow their add keys or do whatever you want. Um, you want to log all that and be able to do something later with it. Really, any change at all that you want to monitor, you can with config. Uh, so to kind of get started with that, uh, you basically put the resources that you want to monitor, then you, or you can just choose everything if you're hardcore. Um, and create your bucket, create the SNS topic like Ken was talking about, and then... Uh, make the magic happen. Yeah, that's what I was saying. If it's not in there, when you get to that step, you got to start this whole thing over again. Right, so, so yeah, that's why, that's why it's in that order, because uh, then you can't pick it if you haven't created it yet, which I guess is not necessarily yeah. true that we'll discuss it next. We already talked about it. Yeah. And then uh, allow the role that you want to be created and set. All right, cool. All right, so CloudWatch is a little bit more interesting. Some of the things we talked about are just enabling them and using them, right? Um, CloudWatch is pretty cool because you can be, you know, if you look at config, it's sort of like a, um, kind of a dumb tool. It just tracks anything that's changing. Um, and CloudWatch is more of you defining what specific events um, should trigger an alarm, right? So the three, actually four use cases that we're going to cover are uh, billing alerts, tracking root account usage, and then failed login attempts. Uh, and then there's unauthorized activity that kind of ties back to the interrogate tool that you wrote. So in terms of the billing alarm, it's pretty easy to set up. You, um, the reason that you set this up is that if somebody breaks in, what we've seen, what we've seen over and over again is people, they kind of find out like, hey, I've, I'm spending $20,000 or $30,000 overnight and I only spend like 500 or whatever the case may be. So this is kind of a nice little heads up that somebody's spinning up EC2 instances in your environment or whatever they're spinning up and using. So to do this, you go into billing and you first allow yourself to, to receive billing alerts. And then next, you go in and you create a topic, recount usage, whatever the case is, you subscribe to it, and then you go into CloudWatch. When you go into CloudWatch, there's something on the left I want you all to pay attention to. There's, there are metrics and there are logs. Think of metrics as these are predefined things that you can go in and say, um, hey, you know, 
you already know about billing numbers. And I, so I want to say, hey, if uh, I'm exceeding this number, then cool, give me an alert. Logs, however, you delving into the logs, searching for something specific, and then uh, triggering on that. I think we're boring people. Yeah, You're sorry. Boring, man. Uh -huh. All right, so <clears throat> go in, choose uh, your, uh, your billing alert. Uh, this is US dollars that we're choosing here because we're in the US. Uh, put in a number, this is 1600. We chose 1600 as our monthly spend that we don't want to go over or we want to get alerted on if we go over. Uh, enter that, create the alarm. Um, I've got exact steps here. So um, once this is created, you now, every time you start to go over that monthly spend number, you get a notification. So whoever has subscribed in whatever form or fashion to that topic is how you're going to get alerted the SNS topic. And again, exact steps at this link. Root account login, why is this important? Okay, so this is more than just uh, me talking about you know, something that you configure. I wanna give you an actual use case around this. So when, when our team enabled this, um, remember I said, hey, don't use your root account operationally. That's a bad idea. So now when somebody has to, like absolutely has to use the root account, they tell somebody that they're going to use it. The reason is, is when they don't, and we see these alerts, everybody panics, everybody freaks out. It's like, hey, nobody told us they were gonna be using this. And you become that guy or girl. So that wasn't on purpose. That was just something that sort of came along uh, culturally as we enabled these alerts. So kind of a nice thing that we found uh, an actual use case for this, uh, or found when we actually use this. So. To enable it, it's again, very uh, simple, but instead of going to metrics, you go into logs within CloudWatch. Once you go to logs, you choose the CloudTrail log that's relevant, and then you go into where you put in a uh, sort of a, an expression, and I give a link at the end, we give a link at the end where there's this uh, list of expressions that you can use to find events. This one's just to you know see if the root account actually logged in, uh, follow the steps, they're very, very easy to follow and then create the alarm once that's complete. And you basically say, hey, look, if this person's uh, logged in within the last five minutes, send an alert. That's really the end of it uh, with the root, root account. And again, with this, we've got exact steps. Failed logins. Um, all right, so in the event that someone's trying to break in, we obviously want to know about it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about its limitations here with this, what I, what I actually found. Um, to save time, the steps are pretty much the same as the last one. The only thing that changes is that little filter pattern that we use. That's it. It's the only thing that's different. Steps are the same. And again, we have exact steps. So <clears throat> with this, the only problem is, is when you get this alarm, it doesn't tell you exactly like who's trying to log in and you know, who's having the issue and you know, when exactly or what IP was it from and some exact details. So. Uh, Working on a fix for this, um, as soon as I can get that done, I'll probably add it to these slides, but uh, there are some limitations I want you to be aware of, aware of uh, with this. So unauthorized activity alarm. Now this goes back to the tool that Chris wrote. If somebody actually, you know, they've grabbed your access key, it was exposed, and they wanna see what they can do in your environment, this is the alarm that actually prevents them from doing anything. So I'm giving you the, uh, you know, the exploit side and the defensive side. Um, all right, so uh, in the interest of time, as far as the root account login and the failed login alarm, the steps are pretty much the same. Regex is, of course, different, or the filter pattern. I call it regex, but that's what it is. All right, so when we run the interrogate tool, this is an example of us taking the interrogate tool. I've kind of blacked out some things I don't want you to see, but uh, when we run the tool, you can see that we immediately get a notification allowing us to decipher, hey, something's going on, someone's trying to uh, do something they, don't, they shouldn't be uh, authorized to do, which I think is, is not only, when you think about it, it's not only relevant from a like, hey, somebody's trying to, they've stole a thing, a key, and they're trying to figure out what they can do, but it's also relevant for like the insider threat, right? The people that have minimal access that are maybe trying to do something or access data they shouldn't be. And I know there's, uh, some companies out there that have to deal with that. Yeah, I mean, that's relevant, relevant if you have actual roles in the organization of like who should be able to access what, and you've got some segmentation and separation 
Uh, you could definitely create an alarm from an abuse or fraud perspective or internal uh, insider threat thing of, hey, this group should not have access to that, and I want to know when someone tries to access that, that piece of data or that S3 bucket or whatever it is. Yep. Yes. So that's how you can do it. <laughs> And then for the filter patterns, if you want to dig deeper, you want to, and I, you absolutely should. This is just, this is, the, this is the bare minimum. These are the bare minimums, minimums you should apply to your, uh, to your AWS environment. Obviously, you should dig, should dig in more. So, all right. So this is you, right? Oh, yeah, Splunk. Yay. Yay! Back to Splunk. Splunk's all right. So it's a good resource for monitoring that. It also comes with plugins for AWS. Um, and do you need, you need enterprise for that? Though? Yeah, you need. You enterprise. do need the enterprise. So like I mentioned. Uh, a lot of the cool functions are made or turned into Splunk apps, which does require you to outlay a little bit of cash. But um, there's two really; those are the two really good Splunk apps that allow you to import um, various data about your AWS account into that. Things like billing uh, can create topological topology maps. Topology maps. There we go. See, no booze, uh, and then all the things listed there. So. Um, that's all useful to know, and if you're a Splunk shop, it's useful to have that in one place and create alerts, also create alerts on it. So this is an example of um, hosts that you're running. Is that right, Ken? Yep. With the app, it, will, it can map out the things that you have created and make a network graph for you so you can get an idea of things, visually see if things have started up or other things like that. That, is, that part's really nice. It's really useful. Uh, spend, so you can also kind of get a visual idea of who's spending what. Um, if you've got developers spinning up and doing whatever they want on any given day. Uh, could want to know when the guy stood up the one with the two beast GPUs and yeah. they're cracking passwords for fun on it. One of those $1,000 a day uh, AWS instances. So it does need an account in order to retrieve that data. Um, you can create the account and then grab the necessary permission policy at that link, uh, but it does work pretty well. Highly recommend that if you're using Splunk, or using ADFs to use that, it can pull in a lot of those alerts for you if you don't want to configure them like Ken showed us. Um, then you basically, man, you cannot read that. On the, yeah. Sorry. Um, basically, you just set it up, configure each input, and you're good to go. So, um, so to view things like IAM activity, you subscribe to that log via SNS, and then use SQS to subscribe to that topic. Yeah. Or that's SQS queued. basically queues up and SNS subscribes to that and then you get a notif well Splunk gets a notification yeah right. so you can see like again I think expanding on that I mean yeah some of our alerts will trigger you immediately right um, but when you want to go in and just do like a weekly audit or whatever the case is with Splunk it's really nice because you can see like more than just unauthorized uh, Activity, right. you can see, you know, hey, somebody switched their SSH key pair or they changed their password or whatever the case is. There's a lot of activity you can view with that Splunk app. Yeah, I mean, you can also use Splunk to generate your queries and alerts, and that can also feed into your SIM if you're using that, right? So any, any Splunk query can be turned into an alert, which can be turned into uh, forwarded to ArcSight or Phantom Cyber or whatever you're using to monitor that stuff. You want to do it? Yeah. So just uh, you want to be aware when things happen that they're happening, right? I mean, it's, it's essentially like the moral of my story personally when, you know, there was a threat of attack. What I realized very quickly was that if, so, if something had happened with AWS, there's like no way we would have known. Absolutely. I mean, we would have known. At, sorry. There is a way we would have known. We would have known when, when we saw a bill. You. Yeah. <laughs> and when nothing worked. And uh, we're embarrassed, sure. Yeah, then we would know. Yeah, absolutely. But in terms of being proactive while something's happening, monitoring was incredibly important and very, for me, again, and, and I know for Chris as well, a very personal um, thing that we needed to, to make sure that we did. So it's our responsibility. Um, and also, since we break stuff, we feel like we should probably show how to do that. I'm trying to be a fixer as well, yeah. so give some ways to catch me. Yeah. So... Um, in terms of uh, the cure thread that I keep mentioning, there's a few things I just want to point out real quickly. Okay, so one thing is AWS has like a little review board, right? Um, and so let's say your company got hacked and you don't have $50,000 a month to spend, you've got 2,000 or 1,000, whatever the case is. All right, so you go up for review, you say, hey, look, yeah, we were hacked, but we don't have the, the money to pay for this. This is, this is a huge hit, you know? 
What AWS says is, hey, did you do the minimums? We give you all of these checklists, we give you free CBTs, we give you all this information. Did your company do the absolute minimum required to secure your environment? And if the answer is no, you might find yourself paying anyways. Hopefully you've got insurance. So that's sort of like the reason that I, I implore you to at least uh, try to do these, these bare minimum uh, security pieces here. Another thing that was interesting, I mean, Chris and I already know this, and I think probably a lot of people in this uh, audience know this, but there are bots every day scouring GitHub, scouring Bitbucket. They're looking for these keys. That's all they do. Um, they want to find an open uh, AWS environment where they can spin things up, where they can spend your money. Uh, so the last, yeah. The I last... personally did it, and I found a couple a day easily. So yeah, that's manually looking. Not a bot. Not a bot. CG bot. Yeah. So um, on that note, you know, again, when we talk about relevance, when you go through just that one thread alone, not like the other places where you're looking to see, hey, who did this happen to? When you go through that thread alone, this happened over and over and over again to folks. Like, just it was like, yep, me too, yep, me too. And uh, it's just sort of, it's kind of sad, but it's preventable. You know, that's, I guess, what it comes down to. And again, API, multi-factor authentication. We'll get to that in a second. Do you want to let him ask a question? Or? Sure. Yeah, actually. Yeah, we're doing good on time. We're doing good on time, yeah. I don't know. In the sense of, okay, so the question is if it's so easy. Why? Ah. Question to Amazon. Is there anybody who works at Amazon? Yeah, I don't know. All right. Amazon, if you're listening, you need to create a bot that does this and alert your customers. Belay my last. <laughs> the comment was they do do that some for yeah. the uh, recording. OK, so. Um, we're going to get to re restoration and recovery now. This is sort of like the last piece of this presentation. Um, again, plan to fail, don't fail to plan. I think that's a good motto. Um, biggest thing here, don't use AWS to back up your AWS, right? And there's a very big caveat with that. I'm talking about your primary account or, you know, don't use the same AWS account to back up your stuff. I'm pretty sure everybody in this room can figure out why. There are a lot of people that haven't figured out why, but, um, they, somebody gets access, they burn everything down to the ground, you're not going to have your backups anymore, right? So you can't restore it from nothing. So um, the thing that I have seen work, though, is using like a secondary or tertiary account that only a, a security or operate, you know, SecOps team has access to. And that AWS environment is super locked down, and they use S3 and Glacier to actually keep backups pushed over to that account. Um, and that's actually a reasonable approach because the other approach, there's not a silver bullet for it, right? There's especially not, if it's, especially if it's read only, right? It's yeah, just pulling that data and can't delete it. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, um, otherwise, you have to. Uh, there's no service you can pay as of right now. So, if anybody's got any startup ideas they're looking for, there's no service right now. It's like a silver bu silver bullet where you hand them cash and they like back up your AWS that I could find anyways. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. I want to hack that. Yeah, so uh, <coughs> list of common things to back up and uh, resources on how to do some of this. Um, All right, so uh, this incident is, response, this. and it's actually the same thing, plan to fail, just don't fail to plan. Um, it could actually be his whole talk, we're not gonna do it. Uh, if you kinda, from like a blue teamy perspective, Scout, anybody heard of Scout 2? No, check it out, because it basically allows you to give it some IAM keys and then it enumerates and checks out all the configs, who has access to what, makes a fancy report for you. And I'll also throw a pitch to um, Andrew Krug and Alex McCormick's talk they gave at DerbyCon on hardening AWS. So it covered a bit of what we talked about, but more importantly, uh, they have a whole incident response suite. So in the ability you guys want to handle that or try to take that on or have the ability to take that on, I, I encourage you to check that out. They've got, if you like, have all like the, uh, Linux kernels and things for all the AMIs. So if you need to do memory forensics, you know, you need to basically make a, a kernel module that will load, so allow you to pull, pull memory from the images. They have a whole suite of tools that do that for you. So if that's something you're interested in and just don't want to call in the Mandiant, uh, you know, Blackhawk to help you out, um, you can check out that talk. 
Okay, so, so I guess we're finished. That's it. We're 10 minutes left. Are there any questions? Yay. I, are you clapping because we're finished or clapping because you? Right. Definitely because we're finished. Yeah, um, okay, cool. So questions, I guess. Oh, good point, thank you. I should have put that at the end. Yeah. Oops. So the yes. question was, can you put this URL? For those of you that were late, uh, you don't get to download it, no. Um, this is just the URL where you can download the slides. Okay, so the question was, how well do Windows workstations uh, integrate into Elk? Uh, you have to have some sort of syslog type thing to forward them. So I don't think there's log stash for Windows, but we uh, you could use a syslog, forward them to the uh, collector, and it works just fine. Yeah, it will collect all the Windows events or uh, whatever you want to throw at it. Yeah. So the question was, uh, what tools do we use to do the follow-up the follow kind of triage and response to these alerts? Uh, do you want, I have. Well, I think some, uh, the triage in terms of incident response or tri triage instead of just being like just proactive, uh, you know. Well, I guess it's incident response altogether. So right? I'll say um, we feed all of ours into, um, I think it's, it's into Phantom Cyber, which is like ArcSight or whatever. So it goes into a sim. Uh, those kinds of tools generally allow you to enrich those alerts. So uh, this user ID did something, and it will have a context worker that will, okay, who is that person? That's turning user ID into a, a phone number via the information from Active Directory. Uh, they went to, a, you know, it went to a weird IP. Who is the IP? And just shoves all that data in there. So whoever's triaging can have, at least have a bigger or a better picture of what's going on and just hopefully decide, is this something that I can just close out and ignore as like normal developer activity or is this something that we need to rally the troops and look into? I can talk to you a little bit more about that if you want. Yes, sir? Did you re-say that you have a twist on the Ben Franklin quote on the fail to plan? Can you say it again? Oh. Oh, it's a uh, plan to fail but don't fail to plan. Anything else? All right, cool. Hit us up on Twitter or whatever if uh, you have questions or hate. <laughs> I Hope won't respond to hate. I coughed on the red cards, so. Yeah, don't, don't touch the red cards. Thanks, All everyone. Right. All right, thank you.